Welcome to the first lecture of formal models on temporal logics. In the past lectures we have talked about modeling languages that allow us to describe various kinds of systems in a concise way such that we can understand their behavior. Now the question is how can we define properties that these uh, systems should satisfy and then how, how can we check it? So I will answer the, the first questions question in the next two lectures and will give you an extension of propositional logic that or two extensions of propositional logic that allows us to describe temporal properties. Yeah? So what what are temporal properties and what they are good for? Uh, in contrast to um, reasoning with propositional logic, as we have done it in logic, we want to talk about the evolution or the execution of a system and talk about the behavior at different time points and we want to relate properties a system has at different time points. And we want to say what is happening tomorrow, what is happening in some, at some point in the future, what has to hold always, um, what has to happen repeatedly and so on. Here on this slide I have a couple of examples um, that give us properties for various kinds of systems. So for example, um, tomorrow the weather is nice. There we have a temporal aspect in this property. Um, the, the reactor is not going to overheat in, in no future. Yeah, so this should never happen. Then, um, in case a crash happens, um, the central locking of a car should open immediately. Yeah? So if a certain event happens, then uh, something else should uh, be triggered. Uh, then we want to check that um, uh, some faulty behavior never occurs, like uh, that uh, an airbag only inflates if a car crash happens. Uh, we want to check that um, and one event triggers another event, for example, when, when we have a, a server and a client communicating, then uh, we want to ensure that an acknowledge uh, um, signal has to be preceded by a request um, signal and this should definitely happen. Uh, and another example is that uh, if the elevator is called, it will show up eventually. Yeah, so that it can never happen that somebody is waiting um, infinitely for, for an elevator and has to walk um, and take the stairs. Yeah, and temporal logic is often used to uh, specify properties of concurrent and reactive systems and then use techniques of model checking to uh, figure out if these properties hold or if they do not hold. It's also very natural, as we will see, to use it in the context of hardware systems. Um, here the models that we can easily get from hardware systems, like very close to the I.O. automaton we have already seen, um, are very suitable for, for checking this kind of properties. And yeah, there is not only one temporal logic, but there are many temporal logics and it depends on the concrete application what is most suitable and in this um, course we will see two very popular temporal logics. The first one which we discussed today is linear temporal logic and the next one we will see in another lecture uh, which is CTL. And we will also discuss what is uh, the difference between the linear temporal logic LTL and the branching tree logic um, CTL. Yeah, and in order to um, use temporal logic and to apply them for the verification of some systems, we have first of all think how do we represent um, the systems such that we can um, then check the, the temporal properties with with the formulas and and also we we need some 
measurement or some granularity for, for time steps. Yeah? And this also has to go into the model we are considering. And here the idea is we, we use some kind of finite automaton. We will immediately see um, how, how a very popular type of automaton looks like, which is uh, used for, for checking temporal logic formulas. And then each transition from one state to another state happens at one time uh, point. Yeah? So when you think back about this circuit we have seen, then a uh, transition from one state happens with one tick of the clock and we can then go to the next state. Okay, and in principle we could use the finite automata that we have previously introduced uh, for model checking, maybe even also consider consider petri nets or for for that. But the most common um, modeling language for in the context of um, checking temporal formulas are Kripke structures. Why do don't we use the automata? We, we have seen before, why don't we use them and um, introduce another um, type of automaton or we could also use the LTS, which we are also very close to the finite automata. Um, yeah, we have one problem there. When we, we think about an LTS or an arbitrary finite automaton, then the characteristics of the systems of the system it describes is not encoded in the states but it is encoded in the transitions between the state yeah between the states we have the the actions that happen when we go from one state to another so these um, models formulated in an LTS do not provide any information about um, properties that hold in a certain state. And this is rather inconvenient for checking. In principle, we could um, define a temporal logic that operates not on properties of states, but on the transitions. And in fact, we did something like that in the past. Um, in, in previous lectures, when you go back to the old videos on the web page, you will find an extensive discussion of Hennessy Miller, Milner logics, which exactly are following this idea of having um, temporal um, properties to be checked for LTS. Yeah? So they somehow check the properties that hold for, for the actions and the, the transitions. But it, it's not the most natural thing to do this. And in practice, um, this Hennessy Milner logic is not so widely used, uh, and in fact, um, other logics like LTL and CTL are implemented in tools or variants of those logics, but they give really the foundations. And uh, therefore, this year we will only focus on uh, LTL and CTL. And in case you are interested in the Hennessy Milner logics, you can watch the old videos, but this year we will not discuss them. Yeah, so before we introduce LTL, let's have a look how a Kripke structure look like. And it's you will see it's, it's very close to the things um, we have already seen and it's uh, it should be already very familiar to you. And it provides Kripke structures provide the classical model for temporal logics, and the the main difference yeah there are some some differences to LTS. Um, the the first thing that is different is that we only have states and uh, no actions, and this is in fact an LTS with only one action. So the size of the alphabet is one, and since there is only one action, we immediately um, can skip it. Uh, to make it interesting, uh, something else is added uh, because if we would have just an, an LTS with one 
uh, symbol in the alphabet, this would be rather boring. Uh, instead, we have annotations for the states with atomic propositions. Yeah? So we have information what properties hold in a state and which do not hold. Yes? For example, um, an pro atomic proposition is something like the sun shines, um, the, um, the car is on, um, or the door is open and things like that. Yeah? And if we then do a transition to the next state, then maybe in the next state the door is closed. And so, so we, we model the behavior of the systems, system in uh, terms of its states. And uh, as many other formalisms, it has its uh, roots in, in artificial intelligence, uh, in the symbolic branch. And the, here the keyword is model logics, which in fact are very, very closely related to the temporal logics we will see um, uh, today. And the idea behind model logic is um, to, to describe the world of an agent or an agent is interacting in and to have uh, somehow the, the states of this world and then see uh, what, what is happening. And then we have the modalities um, and they are very, very close to the temporal operators that we will introduce soon. Yeah, but uh, today I will not talk about model logics, uh, but about temporal logics. And um, here I have now the full definition of a Kripke structure. Um, so first of all, we have a set of atomic propositions A here. And these are simply Boolean predicates like um, sun is shining, um, yeah, door is open. So they can be either true or false. This is like the alphabet we have when we build a propositional formula. And in fact, for building our formulas later on, these will be uh, the atoms from around which we build our formulas. Okay, and now we define a Kripke structure. And this is um, simply um, an, a kind of automaton that consists of the following components. We have a set of states, S. Um, we have a set of initial states, which is a subset of S and which is not empty. So we have at least one initial state for the Kripke structure. Uh, then we have a total transition relation, um, which um, relates two states, which relates to states. And here total means that um, for all states, um, there is an other state such that uh, we can do one step. Yeah, this means that a Kripke structure does not have any dead end. We can always proceed um, to a next state. Yeah, and uh, since it's a transition relation and not a transition function, it's not deterministic. Uh, what is the next state? So there. there can be multiple options, but there is at least one step that can be done from every state. And we do not have any final, final states like in, in the LTS um, because we are um, again dealing with reactive systems which are not supposed to terminate. In case a terminating system, um, like for example a coffee machine should be modeled, uh, then one could add an extra state um, where, which is um, the end state and where we loop forever, like in, in, an, in the power automaton construction. Yeah? So, uh, talking about Kripke structures, um, with having a total transition relation is much easier and simplifies things. We then do not have to make certain uh, case distinctions and therefore we assume it's total and we can always do a step from any state. Yeah, and uh, finally, what we need is we need um, the properties that hold in the, in the different states. And for this, we have a labeling function and this functions 
function assigns to each state a set a subset of the atoms yeah so that um, if we have a state uh, small s uh, then we know which properties hold in this state so all um, of these uh, atoms which are assigned to this uh, state small s hold in this state and the others do not hold yeah, so the labeling maps a state S on to the set of atomic propositions that hold in the state. And that's basically it. Yeah, so um, here we have an example, um, also with some motivation um, uh, from, from a verification context. So assume we have given two processes P and Q that share a resource R. Um, we are interested in describing the behavior of the system with respect to the access of the resource. And um, if the resource R is accessed by process P, then uh, property small p is true. If resource R is accessed by process Q, then property small q is true. Yeah? And here we have uh, an initial state A. This initial state is called A. And in this state, the resource is accessed by none of the processes. And then we can do several transitions, which um, show us how the um, access of the resource um, is um, happening. And yeah, now this is a very small example and we immediately see what is ongoing. But in a complex system where it's not clear uh, which states are reachable and which not, then it's an, interesting to que it's an interesting question if it is possible to reach a state where R is used by both P and Q at the same time. So if this state D we have here is uh, reachable from the initial state. Yeah? And for, for this very small example, it's clear that if we do one, two steps, then uh, we can uh, reach D and um, this most likely is a state where we have a problem. Yeah? But in imagine a system where you have thousands, maybe millions of states, um, then, then it's not so trivial to see what is ongoing. And then tools are needed which perform the checking. Yeah, and um, this is an example of the Kripke structure. And uh, now let's have a look how uh, a Kripke structure relates to um, LTS. So assume we have done a lot of modeling and we want to get uh, an LTS. How uh, and we, we already got an LTS and now we want to do um, temporal reasoning on our model. How how do we get a Kripke structure? And um, here on the next slide, I I have the construction um, which tells us how we can translate. Um, a complete LTS uh, into a Kripke structure. Yeah? So um, we are given this LTS SL with the states SL, with the initial states S, uh, IL, with alphabet sigma and uh, transition relation TL. And uh, we want to have this Kripke structure here. Or which also has states, which has initial initial states, uh, which have has this total transition relation, and which has a labeling function. Okay, and now we do a trick that is a bit similar as the trick we did for the Oracle automaton. Um, so in the Kripke structure, we do not have um, labels on the edges on the transitions, but um, what we can do is we can or what we will do is we, we move this into the states and have the properties there. And um, um, yeah, let me first formally describe what we are doing and then we will look at an example and we will see it's rather straightforward how, how to obtain uh, the uh, Kripke structure of an LTS. So first of all, the alphabet of the Kripke structure A is uh, simply the alphabet 
we, we get from the LTS. Then uh, for the states uh, of the Kripke structure, we simply take the cross product of the states of L um, together um, with the alphabet. So we have pairs where the first component is a state of the LTS and the second component is an element uh, of the alphabet of the LTS. Yeah, then the initial states of the Gripka structure is simply the cross product of the initial states of the LTS and the alphabet of the LTS. So um, we have uh, pairs that have the initial have the, an initial state of the LTS as the first component and a symbol of the alphabet of the LTS as the second component. And yeah, now having these pairs as the states, we define the labeling function as follows. So if we have a state in the group structure as A, then we map each state simply to the second component. So we map it to A. Yeah, And the most complicated thing in this definition is the transition, rela la transition relation. So if we can to do um, a, a step from a state S with a symbol A to a state um, S prime in, uh, in the LTS, then we can uh, do a step in the uh, Kripke structure uh, from state S A to state S prime, uh, A prime, where A prime is an arbitrary symbol from uh, the alphabet of uh, the LTS. Yeah? So um, what, um, what we can, um, so and, and um, this goes in two directions, so this is a, a unique mapping. Uh, and uh, what we do here is we say, okay, we are now in this state and uh, then we know that from state S with A we could go to S prime, but um, for the second component we do not know uh, what what is executed in S prime and therefore we introduce a, tran a transition, a connection, an edge uh, to all possible um, states that have S prime as the first component. And what is the interpretation of um, such a pair S prime A? Now this means in state S we are able to execute action A. So and, and this also connects then to the labeling function in state S A holds. And this um, yeah is already the full um, translation. And uh, then it's not very difficult to prove the following proposition. Um, we have um, a sequence S0 or a path S0 to S1 with action A0 and from S1 um, a transition with action A1 to S2 and so on uh, to a state uh, Sn in, in the LTS if and only if we have a path a zero a zero to s one a one to s two a two and so on to s n a n in the Gripka structure, yeah, and um, uh, and I will immediately now show you an example, and then it becomes pretty obvious um, how these two things connect. Um, if you want to prove this uh, proposition, this is a, a very simple induction proof where you show that um, this um, claim holds for zero steps and if it holds for n steps it also holds for n plus one steps. So this you can very easily show with, with an induction proof. Yeah? And yeah, about this note I uh, will talk a bit later. Let's have first a look at, a, at an example that it becomes more concrete. Uh, what I am talking about. Assume we are given here this LTL L, 
um, which we have here on the left, which consists of three states, one, two, three, and two initial states, one, two, and which has alphabet A, B. And we want to have a representation as a Kripke structure of this LTS. So we proceed um, according to the um, construction we have seen just before. And for this purpose, we built all combination combinations of the initial states and the symbols from the alphabet. And we get uh, 1a. I do not write this as pairs, but I just write the symbol of the state and the alphabet symbol next to each other. So we have 1a, 1b, uh, 2a and 2b. And now we want to have the connected states. And I do an on-the-fly construction, meaning that I consider only those states which are reachable from initial states and not all possible states. Start with A1. Um, so now let's discuss again what does this um, 1A mean. It means in state 1 it's possible to do an A. Yeah? And the transitions we now add say if I'm in state 1 and do an A, then we go to a state and in this state, again, an A or a B is possible. Therefore, we add the transition uh, that points to 1A itself and we have the transition that points to 1B. Yeah? Because after doing 1A, I can do another A or I can do a B. If I'm in 1B, then uh, the B leads us to state 2. And in state 2, we can also either do an A or we can do a B after the B in state 1. If we are in state 2 and do an A, we go to state 3. So we have state 3A and state 3B. Also there, A and B are possible. Uh, and this is why it's important uh, to have a complete automaton, because otherwise we would get a dead end, uh, which we do not allow. Yeah, so for example, if there wasn't a B there, then we could still reach 3B, but then we could not proceed from there. And um, yeah, and determinism is not required, then we would just have additional edges if um, there were states that would have outgoing edges with the same, multiple outgoing edges with the same symbol. Okay, then in 2b, uh, we stay in state 2, so we do the self-loop or go to 2a, and in 3a and 3b, we pretty much have the same thing. We have this circle here, uh, because we stay in both cases in state 3. Okay, now let's have a quick look at um, a word that is accepted by the LTS. So maybe, for example, say a, a, B, B, A, A. In, in L, this would give us the following traces. Trace from 1, we go with an A uh, to 1. With an other A, we stay in 1. With a B, we go to 2. With an other B, we still stay in 2. With an A, we go to 3. And with an other A, we go to 3 again. How would this look in K? In K we would start in 1A, then um, we would go to 1A, then we would go to um, 1B, from there we would go to 2B, from 2B we go to 2A, uh, oops, 2A, from 2a we go to 3a and um, that's it. Okay, and if we want to relate this, so we have this 1a, which we have here, here, and this one corresponds um, to the state here. Here the 1b can be found here, the 2b can be found here, the 2a is here and the 3a is here. Yeah. 
one important thing I forgot about the Kripke structures and these are the labels. And this is just a formality, but we have to do it in order to finish it. And we simply take the second component of each state. So here A holds, here B holds, here A holds, here B holds, here B holds, and here A holds. Yeah? So with this, we have really the full Kripke structure uh, specified and uh, can use it for, um, for verification tasks. A bit more on notation. Uh, we often write states as tuple of a size n. And uh, this means if we have n atoms, then the value at position i indicates if atom ai is uh, true or false. So if we have a, a zero or a false at position i, then ai is false. And if we have a one or true at position i, then ai is true. Yeah? And so we can specify uh, the states uh, in terms of the atoms. Okay, let's look at an example where we immediately see how this works. And we have here a circuit with two flip-flops, A and B, which give us the states of the um, flip-flop. Since there is no uh, initialization value given, we assume that all, uh, or that we do not have an explicit initial state, so um, we ignore this. And yeah, now let's have a look what this circuit does. Um, so A is defined as not A, so in each step the value of A toggles. If A is 1, then the next, at the next time point it's 0 and vice versa. And B is A, X or B. And uh, when we think a bit about uh, the functionality of the circuit, then we see that it's a 2-bit counter. Yeah? And um, here we have these notations with the with the tuples. Um, A is true if the bit at the second position is true, and B is true if the bit at the first position is true. And yeah, these uh, pairs of bits give us the states. We have four states. Um, this gives us also the initial states. So everything is an initial state, but we simply ignore them. And then uh, we have the transition relation, for example, from state 0, 0, we go to state 0, 1, from 0, zero 1, we go to state 1, 0, from 1, 0, we go to 1, 1, and etc. And this we can easily uh, depict graphically as we see it here. So this is simply the transition relation um, now graphically represented. Yeah, and here, the modeling is pretty easy because we do not have any inputs. Um, we will see inputs um, at the next slide. Here we have an uh, extended version of the counter with uh, an input R, which allows us to reset the counter to 0, 0. And this works as follows. As long as R is 1, then we have the same behavior as before. If R becomes Force, then uh, A becomes false and also B becomes false in the next step because they are both connected with a logical end um, to the R. Yeah? And we now have um, triples, so triples of size 3, and the first component is R, the second component is the B, and the third component is the A, and now we can graphically represent the Kripke structure. Now the transition relation gets a bit more complicated. And here we also um, see the, the trick we, we used for translating LTS to uh, Kripke structures in a minute. Okay, so here we have the, the transitions that we already know. So if if R is 1, then the behavior is the same as before. And now 
we also have to consider that r is zero. For this, we introduce um, four additional states where it is zero. And if we are here in a state, then at any time r can become zero and then we get to the respective states um, with the zero. Okay, but that's not all. Also the uh, states with R0 require transitions. And here we have now the question what happens if R gets 1 and what happens if R is um, 0. Yeah, because this can always change and we have to consider both cases and uh, if r is 0 we go to the state 0 0 0 from any other states with r 0 yeah. um, if r becomes 1 then uh, we go to state 1 0 0 yeah so this is now the full uh, Kripke structure, I hope I did not miss anything or uh, make a drawing mistake. But um, yeah, this is how, how it looks in principle. And yeah, for this we now can specify properties that we want to check with uh, temporal logic. The last thing that we need before we really can now introduce LTL is the notion of a trace and here we have finite and infinite traces. Now, so finite traces have a certain length and uh, infinite traces are not restricted in the length. So what is a trace? We are given a Kripke structure as introduced before and a trace is simply a finite or infinite sequence of states such that each pair of consecutive states is connected to each other in the um, Kripke structure um, with an edge. So they are directly connected. And this means if we are given a trace, then this is simply a path in the Kripke structure if we consider the Kripke stru structure as, as, as a graph. And yeah, such a path can be finite or infinite. And when you think about a program, then such a trace is uh, simply um, the execution steps that are performed by a program and this is uh, very valuable information for debugging and for uh, reasoning about the execution of a program and therefore a trace is a very natural concept um, to be considered in the context of verification. Yeah, here we have some more uh, notation and terminology so um, we denote the length of the path with these two lines here, left and right, and um, for the length we count the numbers of transitions, so we do not count the number of states, but um, the number of transitions between the states. So here we have an example where we have a trace S0, S1, S2, and this trace has the length 2, and yeah, if, if the trace is infinite, then we write simply this infinite symbol. Uh, a trace can also be considered as a kind of array or a function which maps a natural number to a state and in order to access um, a state at a certain position we write pi so um, we give a natural number i and then we get the state of the respective number and if we have a state i a, a state at position i then this is the state which is reachable with i steps from the state at position 0. Yeah? And often we use this notation uh, here in order to access a certain st uh, to access a state at a certain position. Sometimes we want to eliminate a part of the trace, so we are only interested in the trace starting from position i. And this we write with this notation we have here. So we write p to the power of i uh, for saying that we are interested in states si, si plus 1, and so on. So we get the uh, suffix of p that starts at the, a, uh, at the state i, at position i. And obviously i has to be equal or smaller, smaller 
than the length of the path. And if uh, a path is infinite, then obviously the, the suffix that we obtain is also infinite. And uh, some more notation. Um, if we talk about a concrete trace, like we have it here, ABC, 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 uh, then, yeah, so ABC are also um, some, some state names in this um, context. Um, maybe I should have taken here um, other names, but yeah, doesn't matter. Uh, and then we have this repetition ABC, 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 and to write it down compactly, we write ABC and then to the power of omega. Yeah, let's have a look at a short um, example to make uh, things are more concrete. Assume we have given a Kripke structure A, B, C, and then C we stay forever. Uh, then, for example, a possible trace P is, and I now write it not as a tuple, but I just write the states next to each other. A, B, C is a, is a finite trace, so this trace has uh, length three, go from A to B, from B, B to C, and from C to C again. Uh, another trace, an infinite trace, would be A, B, and C forever, C, C, and so on, uh, which we could uh, call as P prime, A, B, and C omega, and this P prime has length infinite. Yeah, so this is uh, what I wanted to tell you about traces. And now we really start with temporal logics. And now we are ready to finally introduce linear temporal logic, LTL. And before we describe what LTL formulas mean, so before we talk about the semantics of LTL formulas, we first have to define how LTL formulas look like, what they look like. And LTL is simply an extension of propositional logic by temporal operators. And I show you a variant where we have the next operator X, the globally operator G, the finally operator F, which are all three uh, unary operators, and we have the binary operator U. And these we use to construct uh, LTL formulas based on a set of propositional variables of the atoms. And based on these uh, atoms, we build complex formulas. So if A is a set of atoms, then every propositional formula that we can construct over A is an LTL formula. Um, there we have connectives, which we, you know from logic, like uh, conjunction, disjunction, negation, implication, and equivalence, or XOR. And with this, uh, we can build complex propositional formulas. So uh, propositional logic is indeed a subset of LTL. Yeah, and then we want to use the, the temporal operators to construct formulas and for assume that we have given uh, an LTL formula F, which is somehow constructed, then uh, we get another LTL formula by putting the unary operators in front. So XF is an LTL formula, GF is an LTL formula, F, uppercase F, F is an LTL formula. And um, if we have two LTL formulas, F and G, then we can construct another LTL formula with the until operator and get F until G, which is then an LTL formula. Yeah, we also have uh, parentheses and could define rules of precedence in order to define which operator binds stronger. I don't want to do this um, yeah, in case there are ambiguities. We use uh, simply parentheses. Yeah? But in principle, we could um, introduce an agreement or make an agreement uh, which operator binds stronger than another. Yeah? But these are some technicalities which, which are not so important for our purposes. I mean, they are important in practice, but we use parentheses to be on the safe side. Okay, and here I have some examples which refer to the uh, model of the two processes P and Q, which have to share an uh, which have to share a resource R, and which should not access the resource R at the same time. 
and exactly this property that they should not access the resource R at the same time we have formulated here as an LTL formula. formula. And uh, this formula G not P and Q says uh, it always holds that P and Q are not true at the same time. Yeah? Here we could also use the laws of De Morgan to rewrite this formula, so we could also write a G, not P or not Q. And this formula, this formula is true for a given trace if at each uh, position of the trace uh, either P is false or Q is false or both are false. So not bo both are not true at the same time, which would mean that they access both R. Yeah, then um, here we have a formula that says say that uh, processes P and Q can infinitely often access R, which is done by globally finally P and globally finally Q. Yeah, so in each state of a trace, at some point, finally, P becomes true, and at the same time, uh, a similar thing holds for Q. And so the first thing is a, is a safety property. The second uh, property here is uh, a, a so-called um, lifeness requirement, um, which uh, states that um, each of the two processes can infinitely often access the resource. And uh, the last example I've written down here, um, which is globally P implies not next P, uh, says that once process P has uh, resource R, it cannot have it immediately after. Yeah? So it says that once we are in a state where process P has the resource, then in the next state it does not have it any, anymore. Yeah? And uh, here it is important to use the implication and not um, an AND symbol, because um, this globally says that at every state uh, of, of, a, of a certain trace, this uh, subformula we have here is true. And this means it should also hold in the states where P does not have the resource, where the small p is false. And an end is immediately false as soon as um, one subformula is false and for the implication if this p is false then the, this whole subformula is immediately true and only if p is true so if process p has the resource r then the second part is checked therefore we have an implication here with the discussion of the previous examples we already got some intuitive understanding of the semantics and uh, here i have it now formally more formally and uh, we define the true value of a temporal formula always with respect to, a, to an infinite path of a Kripke structure K and uh, check if this uh, given LTL formula holds with respect to a certain path. Yeah? And here we have the different cases with respect to the structure of the formula. We have a case for the um, atom. We have a case for the negation, for the AND, and then for the temporal operators. And um, we do not define the semantics of all propositional operators, but just of negation and AND, because if we think back of the uh, back on the on the logic course, then we remember that these two operators are functionally complete, meaning that every other operator can be expressed in terms of NOT and AND. Okay, but uh, now to, how do we evaluate um, a given LTL formula uh, with respect to a path pi? Yeah, if our given LTL formula is simply an atom, then this uh, formula is true with respect to path pi, uh, if and only if, if this atomic formula is in the set of labels of the state at position zero. Yeah, so it has to hold in the first state of the path P. Yeah? Here we have an entailment symbol which says P is true in pi if and only if this condition here holds. So P has to occur in 
this state at position zero, uh, p has to be true in this state. Yeah, then for the negation, the semantics is not surprising. Not g holds in on path pi if and only if g does not hold on pi. Yeah? So we simply uh, um, say check if g does not hold on the path in order to say that it not g holds. Uh, if we want to know if g and h are true on path pi, then this is the case if and only if g holds uh, on pi and if h holds on pi. Yeah, This is simply the semantics of the conjunction. So both subformulas of the conjunction have to be true in order for the conjunction to be true. Yeah, this is just propositional reasoning, as, as you already should know. Now it's more interesting um, to talk about the temporal operators. And the formula next g is true on path pi if and only if uh, g holds uh, on the path that starts uh, with the next state. Yeah, And this is the state at position 1. So we keep, skip the state at position 0 and check if g holds uh, on the path which is reduced by one state. Yeah? So this is the meaning of next g. We will soon see some examples which makes this more clear. So if I do one step on the path, then g has to hold. Then uh, finally g is true on path pi if and only if we find a position on this path such that from this position on, on the, on the remaining path, g holds. Yeah? And we have to find just one such position. In contrast, for globally g, this formula globally g is true on a path pi if and only if for any state on the path g holds. Yeah? So for all i, um, which are the index variables, which is an index variable giving us some position on the path, if on every position and on every state of the path g holds. And lastly, we have g until h on path pi. Uh, and this one is true if and only if we find a position uh, on the path such that starting with this state there, h start so on the on the on the on, on this path uh, pi where we removed the other states which have a smaller index than i if if on this path h holds and second on on uh, all states which so on all paths which uh, starts with states smaller then uh, which which occur before the state at position i uh, g has to hold yeah so in all states that are before this uh, state i where h have to, has to hold on all states that we entered before g has to hold yeah let's have a look at the visualization and it will be immediately clear what this means uh, but before we look at, at some um, visualization, let's quickly also say what it means that an LTL formula holds for a Kripke structure and um, a, a formula F, an LTL formula F, holds for a Kripke structure K if and only if F holds on all paths, on all infinite paths of the Kripke structure which start with an initial state. Yeah, and there are quite a lot of uh, traces, but we want to capture all possible executions of a program. And uh, we say a temporal logic uh, formula holds for a Kripke structure if it holds for all paths starting with an initial state. Yeah, but uh, now let's have a look, a detailed look at the semantics with some examples. 
um, in order to better understand what is written down here. Okay, so I will show you the meaning of various kinds of temporal formulas with respect to um, very generic parts. And to conclude this lecture, we will have a look at a concrete example. So here um, I do a column where we have temporal formulas. And here um, in the second column, we have some paths with which we respect, with which paths pi which we use to evaluate the formula. Okay, uh, so the first formula we are considering is A, and the path that we have is some infinite path. And we know that in the state at position zero, A holds, and for the other one, we do not care what holds there. Um, in order to evaluate this formula A with respect to pi, so we want to know if uh, A holds in pi, um, we have to check what kind of formulas do we formula do we have here, and we have here a propositional formula which is only a, an atom, and an atom is true if and only if it occurs in the set of labels of the first state, and this is obviously the case. If we would have a path, another path, and we ask again if A holds, and um, we know that not A holds um, in the first state, then we could um, then then we would conclude that A is false in pi. Uh, if an atom does not occur in the set of labels of a state, then we assume not A holds, but we do not write it down explicitly. Okay, then let's look, have a look at uh, next A. And this is only true in a path where A holds in this uh, state at position one. Yeah. So uh, we have, uh, this is not an n, this is an x, next. Uh, and this formula is true if it holds not in the current state, but in the next state. And this is here the case. Then uh, we have um, finally a. And if we have a trace here, we have to find one state, say this here, where A holds, and otherwise uh, it's fine if A does not hold in the other states. We have just to find one state where it holds. Yeah, And yeah, I write it now down explicitly in order to make clear what I mean. So it doesn't, if we just have to find one state where A holds. And uh, then globally A, yeah, this formula is only true if we have um, a, a trace or a path where A holds in every state. So it holds here, it holds here, it holds here, it holds here, and it holds all also in the other states. Uh, it's important also for the evaluation of LTL, which makes it also quite efficient, that we have only a finite amount of states, but we can have uh, an infinite amount or infinite traces because of the loops. yeah. And with uh, fixed point techniques, we can actually evaluate the formula. So there, there are techniques in order to figure out um, if a formula is true or false. And uh, in a later lecture, we will also see how to encode um, the problem of checking a temporal formula in uh, propositional logic. Um, but this we will do, do soon. Okay, and then uh, for the until operator, we have A until B. Uh, this is true in a path. Oops. Which looks as follows. So um, this says A has to hold until 
we first until the first b we see so at some point there has to be a b um, so we have a a a and then at some point we have a b and afterwards it doesn't matter what comes yeah so but in in this state uh, there, there has to be a state um, where b holds and all preceding in all preceding states um, a is true this also means that a until b is not true on a path where a is always true because at some point there has to be a b according to our semantics yeah so um, a until b would not hold on a state a a a a and so on and um, everywhere not b holds uh, not b not b not b and so on yeah then uh, a until b does not hold okay yeah but this is now very abstract and um, i would like to show you next um, how the evaluation of the concrete formulas we have seen on the example in the example before works we are now given the script structure from before and we want to check certain temporal formulas and um, yeah in order to check if a temporal formula holds for the group structure we would have to check it for all paths that are possible and just start with initial state a and this is um, not easily possible by hand but uh, we will consider only certain paths so let's first consider uh, the, the formula globally not p or not q so we want to know if it is the case that um, it can never happen that p and q access the resource at the same time and let's first check if it can happen at the path a c at the infinite path a c so when we loop here we always go from a to c from a to c uh, and so on uh, also from a to c from c to a from a to c and so on okay so what we have to do um, is we have to check for every path uh, for every state on this path if the property holds so we have to check it for a and then we have c a is the remaining part and we have to, to check it for c uh, uh, a c if not p or not q holds there these are the two cases we have to consider yeah, because then we would, then we, uh, when when we show it for this, we can easily um, derive that it also holds for the other states on the path. Okay, um, so this, uh, yeah, let's maybe do it for the second formula, and uh, this formula is true if and only if. Um, not p holds on this path or uh, not q holds on this path okay and uh, now we have here um, a negation as the topmost symbol so we have to check if on this path P does not hold and how can we do this now yeah, we have to check if C in, in state C P does not hold and obviously this is indeed the case so um, we can conclude that uh, not P or not Q holds 
um, for for this given path, starting with a C. Yeah, and uh, we we could do the same for the paths starting with an, starting with an A, and therefore we can derive that uh, the formula holds for for this path. Uh, the situation would be different um, if we had chosen the path A, B, D infinitely often. So A, B, D, A, B, D, A, B, D. Uh, and then it's not very hard to say that not P or not Q does not globally hold. Because here in state D, it's not the case that not B or not Q are true, and therefore this formula does not hold. Um, yeah, let's, let's maybe do um, a second example. Um, let's uh, consider um, the formula um, not Q until P and Q, something like this. So this uh, formulas on the left hand side or on the right hand side of the until can also be um, complex formulas. So let's have P and Q on the right hand side and not Q on the left hand side. Um, let's write it not like this in order to be, cons be consistent. And uh, the path I would like to consider is ABD. And we have to check if on this path um, not Q holds until we find a state uh, where P and Q holds. Yeah, and um, uh, from, from, from which on uh, P and Q holds. And in fact, if we, we can easily prove that D uh, and then A, B, D is the remaining part, uh, is it indeed a, a path, an infinite path, where P and Q holds, because P and Q are obviously true in D. Okay, so this, this is true. And uh, this uh, D A B D is a is a is a part of of this path here. Yeah, so we have A B D, and then we continue with A B D. And uh, in order to have the until operator true, we have to check if in A B D uh, not Q holds. And uh, not Q obviously holds in A, therefore this is true. And we have to check if in uh, B, D, A, B, uh, not Q holds. This is also the case, and therefore this full entanglement holds. Yeah, so A, B, D, omega. So ABD, this infinite path, uh, is indeed a path where this formula not Q until B and Q holds. Yeah? And if we would have given an, um, an, a path, um, if we would have given, for example, AC as a path, and we would check the formula uh, not Uh, yeah, let, let, let's have now the formula not P until P and Q. Then uh, we have a path here, this AC path, where in every state the not P is true. So this part here is true, but we never encounter P and Q. Uh, therefore, this entanglement does not hold this because uh, we never find a state from which on we get a path such that P and Q holds. Um, 
on the other hand, if we would ask if um, in AC omega uh, P and Q holds until not P, then this is true because not P already holds in A. So in every state before, which is no state, um, the first part holds and therefore the full formula, the full uh, until formula holds. Yeah? yeah, and with this, I would like to conclude uh, the lecture uh, that introduces temporal logic. You will see more examples in the Q&A session and in the exercises. And uh, then in the next lecture, we will proceed with another temporal logic, CTL, um, where we do not have this restriction that the future is somehow predetermined by the paths, by the individual paths, which we are considering, by the individual traces, but where we can at each time point make a decision uh, where we want to go next. Yeah? Um, and then we will compare these two logics. This is the plan for next week. Okay, so thank you very much for watching.